If you have your Bible, could you please open it to Romans chapter 12, or if you have a device with a Bible app, go ahead and flip over to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We'll be there in a little bit. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> When I was finishing my seminary studies in Illinois a number of years ago, uh, Libby and I were trying to figure out what the Lord had for us next. We had about a semester of seminary left and it was time to start thinking about what they call placement. So I went to the placement office. This is the office that's supposed to help you get placed in a job somewhere, a ministry somewhere. And I remember uh, sitting down with the guy and Libby and I had talked about it and we figured out over the course of our time together uh, that my primary giftings were preaching and leadership. And so we thought, well, that kind of leads towards a senior pastor or a lead pastor role. And so I went into the placement guy and I sat down and he said, well, what are you thinking, Pete? And I said, well, I think senior pastor role and this is why. And he said something to the effect of, Pete, there's over 1,200 churches in our denomination. There's only two pulpits available and both of them have over 200 applicants, all of them with primary previous experience. Good luck. I'm like, oh, this is encouraging. I've just invested all these years of life in getting prepared for an opportunity that isn't there. And I was really discouraged and I drove home and went to work the next day. I was working part-time as an, an intern at a great church in Antioch, Illinois. I was the senior pastor and me and this was a growing church. And, and when I got to work the next day, he sat me down and he said, Pete, I'm just really excited to let you know that we'd like to offer you a full-time job. We'd like you to be our associate pastor here and, and uh, I'll do the preaching and the leading and, and you'll just do everything else. I'm like, oh, okay. And I was all excited. It's like, oh, we have a direction. And I remember driving home and I'm just like, Lord, thank you for speaking so clearly. It's so great to know what we're going to do. And, and I got home and told Libby, Lib, we got a job offer. It's so exciting and this is what it's going to be. And, and I think this is what the Lord's telling us to do. And she said something to the effect of, wow, do you think he would probably say the same thing to me if we were going to do this together? And I'm like, well, yeah, of course he would. And she said, I'm not getting it. <laughs> what do you mean you're not getting it? She goes, Pete, you're gifted to preach and lead. In that role, you wouldn't do either. What are you thinking? I mean, do you really think if God's wired you this way, he'd put you in a role like that? And I'm just like, oh. Has this ever happened to you where as a couple or maybe as friends, you... Both hear God saying something to you that's different, and you're kind of looking at each other like, well, one of us isn't hearing him right, or one of us he's not talking to, and you start getting all twisted up, and you try to figure it out. It can be a little confusing at times. We decided to put our heads together and pray, and God made it very clear to both of us that that was not a role that we should take, and so I went and turned down the role without anything else on the horizon, which was a little scary, but we just knew that God didn't want us there. You ever hear people talk like that? Like God told us to do something and you're like, how did he tell you? I mean, Pete, how did you know you weren't supposed to take that job? This is a great question. About the same time, um, a, a guy from Bent Tree happened into our church in Wisconsin uh, where my parents were and ran into my mom in the church lobby. His name was Bob. Started a conversation with Bob and Bob was trying to find a pastor for Bent Tree at the time. And so he started to talk to my mom and said, I wonder if you know anyone. She goes, well, tell me what you're looking for. And so Bob started to go through the list of criteria of who they were looking for. And, and the way my mom tells the story, at the, the end of the list, she said, oh, you're looking for Jesus, except just a little older. <laughs> and she said, Bob, that person may exist somewhere in the world, but I'm not sure he'd be ready to come to Bent Tree. Maybe you need to pare the list down a little bit or maybe look for someone who maybe could grow into that list one day. And they had a great conversation. At the end of the conversation, he got, do you know anyone? She said, well, I know someone. Yes, in fact, I know four people I'm going to recommend. She gave him four names. Uh, he called our house the next day. I was um, at school. Libby was home. It was in the evening, I believe. And she picked up the phone. I came home a, a couple hours later, and Libby was crying in the kitchen. I said, honey, what's wrong? She said, we're moving to Texas. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? I went to school this morning, and I come back, and we're moving to Texas. And she said, I talked to this guy on the phone, and I heard about the church, and I heard what they're looking for, and they're looking for us, and we're made for that church, and I just know we're going there. I just know it. 
And I said, well, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> I don't think I want to move to Texas. And, and I said, but let's go down and let's meet him. So we came down for our candidating weekend. And honestly, I had no intention of us moving to Texas. Um, Libby had sensed the Lord leading us here. And we were in different places. We heard different things from the Lord. And about 45 minutes into our conversations with the people at Ben Tree, I looked at Libby and I went, uh-oh. <laughs> she said, what? And I said, I think I love them. And she said, well, that doesn't fit your plan very well. I said, I know, if I love them, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and sure enough, by the end of the weekend, I'd fallen in love with the people of Bent Tree. And as we flew home, I remember on the plane taking a legal pad out, and we did the pros and cons thing, pros on one side, cons. On. You know, how do you make a decision like that? I mean, this is a major decision. This is a 1,000 miles from both of our families. This is huge. How do you decide? How do you know what God wants you to do? And we started to pray. And we started to seek his will. I want to take a little time, uh, just for a couple of weeks, uh, to talk about hearing God's voice, discerning God's will. How do you know when God is speaking to you? Does he speak to you? Is he interested? If he is, how do you know when it's him talking to you? How do you know what he wants? I mean, we can look in Scripture and we can know generally what he wants, for all people, right? But how do we know what he wants for us? Individually, does he care? Is he interested? Is he telling us? As I'm preaching today and next week too, I, I want you to uh, just think about any major or even minor decision that you're grappling with. Is there a decision in your life that you're trying to figure out what God wants you to do? And for some of you, one just instantly popped into your mind. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Whatever it is, I want you to be thinking about that while I'm preaching. I want you to be listening to me, thinking about that decision, and, and asking yourself, how would I uh, go through this process for that specific decision? I remember having a conversation with my dad years and years ago about God's will. And I was curious. I said, Dad, how do you figure out what God's will is? And he drew a picture for me, and I'm going to share that picture with you. So if you've got something to draw on, I encourage you to draw it because I think it might be helpful for you one day. He said, Pete, there are two views of God's will. There are two views of God's will. One is that God's will is a tightrope. You've seen a tightrope, and, and you're on the tightrope, walking along, and you're trying to get God's will. And God's will is like one answer. There's one answer and if you get it right you stay up on the tightrope and then there's another decision you have to make and you've got to find the right answer because there are thousands of wrong answers and if you hit a wrong answer whoosh, ah, 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 <laughs> we don't want this and because we're afraid of this, we're afraid of making a decision a lot of times. We're afraid of stepping into something. And God might be speaking to us, but we're just afraid we're going to miss it. If we don't get it right, and then disaster is awaiting. And so the decisions like uh, the college we're going to go to, it's a big decision, huge decision. Um, should I get married, a spouse, a job offer in another state? Should I buy a new house? I mean, all these fairly substantial decisions that will make a, a big dent in how the rest of your life is lived out, how do you find out what God wants? If it's not a tightrope, if there's not one perfect answer for all these things that it's almost impossible to figure out, then how does it work? What my dad said was, Pete, God's will is not a tightrope. God's will is not, so if you drew this, erase it, or turn the page over, because that's not what it's like. God's will is not a tightrope. God's will is a playing field. It could be any kind of playing field. It could be a football field. It could be a soccer field. It could be a volleyball court. But because God loves basketball the most, we'll make it a basketball court. <laughs> yes. Amen. All right. So general basketball court, right? And this is... God's will. It's not a tightrope. It's a playing field. It's an area. There's lots of decisions that can be right in the middle of God's will. The 
question is, how do we figure out what's best in the middle of God's will? I ask you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Look at the second half of verse 2 of Romans chapter 12. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This verse tells us two things. First of all, it tells us it's possible to discern God's will. It's possible to know what God wants for you. But here's the other thing it tells. It's implied, but it's there. What this verse tells us is that God knows what he wants for you. Think about that for a second. God knows his best for you. His best for you is in his mind already. He already knows what's best for you. And it's possible for you to know it too. Since God's best is in his mind for you already, it is not your job to create it. It is your job to discover it. And the way you discover it is by seeking him, by asking him. He already knows it. You need to know it. You ask him. And in the process, he tells you. But how in the world do you do that? It's a great question. If God's best life for you is in his mind already, how do you discover it? How do you figure it out? I'm going to share with you from this text four words and four questions to ask that are aligned with those words. In any decision you're trying to make, if you will go before the Lord and ask these four questions honestly, I think you might take a major step towards figuring out his best for you in that specific situation. Uh, I think it'll make sense as we go. Um, let's read the text together. He says at the beginning of that uh, section that I read to you, then you will be able to test and approve God's will. After something has happened, then you'll be able to know what God wants for you. What is it that happens? Let me read it to you. Therefore, verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Four words. Circle them in your text. The first one is mercy. Therefore, in view of God's mercy. What does mercy mean? Mercy is his shorthand for a summary of the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. We get that from the word therefore. Therefore, since you've read the first 11 chapters of this book, since you've understood it, therefore, in view of that, God's mercy, I want you to offer yourself. So if you haven't read the first 11 chapters of Romans recently, let me summarize it for you in about 25 seconds. It starts out telling us that in ourselves we are hopelessly lost. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We have separated ourselves from God by our sin. So something dramatic had to happen to fix this problem. Something dramatic did happen. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, came and indwelt a human being. He became Jesus of Nazareth. And he was born and raised and he was fully God and he was fully man. And he voluntarily went and died on a cross and shed his blood. He then rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven. And he tells people, if you will come to me, if you will come to me and trust me and trust the finished work of the cross on your behalf, I will wash your sin away and I will come and indwell you with this resurrection life, transform you, give you a fresh start and change everything. This is the gospel. It's the first 11 chapters of Romans. And Paul assumes you understand it. And what he's saying is, in view of this mercy, mercy is how you get on the court, okay? So if you're drawing along with me, draw yourself, either a little boy or a little girl here on the court. Mercy is how you get in the game. You don't get in the game without mercy. So a number of years ago, when I was growing up in Milwaukee, one of my heroes was a guy named John McLaughlin. If you're from the Midwest, you know John. If you're not, you probably don't. But he used to play in the NBA. He's one of the greatest shooters that ever played in the NBA, he played for the Bucks. And I happened to know John, and one day John said, hey, Pete, I know you're a basketball player. I've got a game going on down at the Mecca, which was like our AAC. He said, you want to come and play? And I'm like, are you kidding? 
It's like my life dream. I'm, I w- always wanted to get in your game. All right, come on Saturdays. So I'm so excited. I went down there, and I'm lacing up my shoes, and I'm looking on the court, and, and it's like former NBA players and like present-day Marquette players and University of Wisconsin players, like guys I watch on TV all the time. I'm like, I'm going to be playing with them. I was just so excited. And it was just incredibly cool until John kind of faked me out. I was guarding him because I was kind of cocky. I got John. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm guarding him, and he kind of faked me out, and I went like that, and then all the way up to this knuckle, I stuck my finger right in his eye, just like that, pulled it out, and his eyes swelled up, and they rushed him to the hospital, and after that, it wasn't any fun at all. But before that, it was a total blast, right? I was just having a great time. And while I was playing, I was thinking, how is it that I'm on this basketball court? And the answer is mercy, the mercy of John, the invitation of John. John made it possible for me to be there. It's the only way to get on the court. And if you want to experience God's best for you, God's best for you is somewhere in here. And the only way you can experience his best for you is if at some point you bow your knee to Christ and you let him forgive you and you let him indwell you and you are now able to experience his best for you. Something happens at the moment of conversion. He comes and he indwells us by his spirit and something new that we've never had before. We have this little voice, this inner voice I'm going to call it a silent yes, or a silent no, as we're seeking his will in the process, the Holy Spirit will, in our hearts, give us a silent mm mm-hmm, or a silent mm mm-mm. As you grow in your walk with him, you'll be able to discern it more and more. I'll show you how that works in just a few minutes, okay? So, mercy is the first thing. How do I get on the court? Only through the blood and the resurrection life of Jesus. Here's the question I'm going to ask. Number one, have I trusted Christ for salvation? Have I received his free gift of mercy? Second word, offer. Offer. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. The word offer is in the aorist tense. Uh, This is a decisive act in a moment of time. You make a decision that I'm going to offer myself fully to him. I'm going to offer my body as a living sacrifice. This is a, a vivid image Not so much for us, because we've never actually sacrificed animals. But these folks, they'd sacrificed animals. They probably could remember the last time they'd taken an animal, and they had slit its throat, and the blood had come out, and they had poured the blood all over the altar, and then they had taken the carcass, and they put it on the fire, and it had burned, and they could smell it burning. I mean, this was vivid stuff. And for Paul to look at them and say, you know what? You are sacrifices. Offer yourself as a sacrifice, but not a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice, because Paul was all about the life of Christ. He wanted to remind us constantly, you're alive in Christ, but now that you're alive in Christ, offer yourself fully to him. Holy and pleasing. You are holy because of the work of Christ. You are pleasing because of the work of Christ. Now that you're holy and pleasing to him, offer yourself to him. This is your spiritual act of worship, he said. Paul uses ambiguous terms. When he says spiritual, it could mean rational. It's kind of interesting. Worship could mean service. So it could be this is your rational act of worship, this is your spiritual act of service, or anything in between. The point is what he's saying is this is how you play the game. Once you get on the court, the way you play is by offering yourself fully to Jesus. And each time you have a major decision to make, you offer yourself fully to Jesus. Like for real. So when my mom was younger and still single and longing to be married, she decided to sit down and come up with a list. She was going to help God out. And so she came up with the list and she wrote down everything she wanted in a husband. And each night she would kneel by her bed and she would pray through the list. God, give me a man with this and this and this and this and this and this. And after a few months of this not working... She started to wonder, am I doing something wrong? Why isn't this working? So she got on her knees and she held the list and she said, what am I doing wrong? Why isn't this working? And she sensed the Spirit whisper to her, just give me the list, Joe. Let me write it. And she had to submit 
her will to his. Submission. It's a fascinating word. What does the prefix sub mean? It's something is, uh, a, a, a submarine travels where? Under the, the marine, under the water, right? A sub-Saharan countries are below the Sahara Desert. Subterranean means under the terrain, or the terrain. Sub means under. Submission. I'm placing my mission under his mission. Here's the problem. Here's why we don't hear God very often. Because our mission is bigger in our lives than his mission. Our idea is more important to us than his idea for us. But he's got the best idea in his mind already for you. He already knows it. You don't have to create it. You have to discover it. The way you discover it is by offering yourself fully to him. Offering it. All right. Whatever you want, I'll go with it. Truly giving it to you. Submission. Submitting my mission under yours. So the question we're going to ask is, have I offered myself to Christ in this? Have I offered myself to Christ in this? When I was a young man, my dream was to be a professional basketball player. And I would practice in my backyard uh, sometimes for three hours a night. I mean, I just practiced and practiced and practiced. I just dreamed of being a professional basketball player. And, uh, and I remember uh, about my sophomore year in college, I was playing in college, but I was having a hard time getting on the court. And I thought, if I can't play in college, the pro dream is probably drifting away on me here. And so I was kind of having a crisis moment. I was kind of before the Lord saying, all right, um, that's probably not going to work. So what do you have for me? What do you want me to be about? What do you want me to do with my life? And I went on a mission trip that summer uh, with sports ambassadors. I was on a basketball team. I went to the Philippines. At the beginning of that trip, um, I remember, honestly, coming before the Lord and offering my future to him and just said, all right, this is the summer. I'm going to be available to you. Talk to me. Tell me. I need to know. What do you want? Offered myself fully to him, whatever you want. And he started to speak to me in different ways, through different people and different circumstances and quiet times. And it was really an exciting summer. I was starting to get a little feel for where he might be leading me. We got to a little town called Boholon. There was a pastor there. He'd been there five years. He had five people in his church. One of them was the little leper boy. One of them was his wife and then like two other people. But he loved this little community. Even though they hated him, they rejected him. They would throw things at him when he walked down the street. I got to visually see them terribly reject him. And I never saw his smile fade because he was in the center of God's will for him. He, he'd found God's best for him. Even though on the outside it didn't look like it was working all that well. After one such event, one evening when he was just ridiculed by the town, I felt so bad for him. And he encouraged me so deeply in his attitude towards it. I was laying on my mat in my little thatch roof house, little bamboo mat on the floor, and I had a little chat with the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, I saw his pastor's heart, and something started to beat inside my heart. And I saw it. And I think I want to do that. If that's what it means to be a pastor, I think I want to do that. And then I asked a simple question. God, is that what you want me to do? Is that what you want me to do? And in my spirit, I sensed a silent yes. It felt like peace and rest and joy. I pictured myself pastoring people, and there was life in it for me. And in my spirit, I sensed the Lord saying yes. I said, okay. Because I'd already offered myself to him. I said, okay, I'm in. Show me what happens next. What happened next was a little surprising. I've told you that part of the story. I've never told you this part. Uh, when my trip to the Philippines was over, um, there was another trip going out to South America with the same organization, and one of their players had dropped out, so they asked me if I would play on that team as well. So I literally flew home, flew home from the Philippines, got to my home uh, in a taxi cab because my parents were out of town, 
uh, ran upstairs, took all my summer gear from the Philippines out of my suitcase, threw some winter gear in to my suitcase, went back out, got in the cab, went back to the airport, and flew to South America. And for five weeks in South America. Oh, to be young again. <laughs> but what was really exciting was at the end of this time, we were playing a lot of the professional teams down in South America, and I had a really good uh, season down there. And at the end of it, one of the pro teams came to me and handed me a letter and offered me a spot on their team. It's like my dream, a pro basketball player. I'm like, Jesus! <laughs> yes! And within two seconds, I got a silent no in my spirit. I instantly knew I just wasn't going to do it because he'd already given me his silent yes, and it was as clear as the day is long. Because I had offered myself no strings attached. I'm available, talk to me. Submission, my mission under his mission, available for what he wants. The third word, it's a very important word, World. World. Verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Another way to translate it. Stop being molded by the fleeting fashions of this age. Stop being formed by what the world says. The reason that this picture is such a good picture is because with a sports court or a field, you have boundaries. If something is happening in here, it is what's called inbounds. If something is out here, what's it called? Out of bounds. There are some things that are simply out of bounds. All the passages in the Bible that start with these words, do not, they're about to tell you something that's out of bounds. Here's why it's important to know what's out of bounds and what's inbounds. Because God's best for you is in here not out here. As soon as you step out here, you are moving away from God's best for you. You are sacrificing what ultimately could be your best life. And you're settling for something that Satan has convinced you is better than what God has, and I'm here to tell you it's not. Your best is in here. And so we do not conform any longer to those things that are out of bounds. Here's the question I'm asking. A really simple one. Is this out of bounds? Is it out of bounds? Fourth word. Transformed. Transformed. Do not any longer be conformed to the patterns of this world, but instead be, that tells us that this verb is in the passive voice, so that means it's something that God does to us, not something that we muster up the strength to do. We do not transform ourselves. We do not change our lives. Only God can do that. But we are told to allow him to transform us. Be transformed. The word transform there is metamorpho, from which we get metamorphosis. It's a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Have you ever seen a butterfly go back to caterpillar stage? No. If you ever were to talk to a butterfly, would you like to become a caterpillar again? What are you, nuts? No way. Much better being a butterfly than a caterpillar. No one would ever go back. It's impossible to go back. Once we are new in Christ, we are new in Christ. We're butterflies. We have been transformed. We've been changed. Christ now lives in us. The Savior lives in us. And the Christian life is all about our behavior matching the Savior that's in us. Can I say that again? The Christian life is all about our outward behavior matching our inward Savior. And we are transformed in our behavior by the renewing of our mind, it says in the text. By spending time in God's word, by listening to him, by learning who I am in Christ, who he actually is, how amazing his work is, how sufficient he is, what God the Father is really like. I mean, we learn from God's word what this all looks like. And as our mind is renewed, our outside behavior starts to match our inside savior and we are growing in our faith. We're growing in our faith. <clears throat> the question we're going to ask here is, will 
this help me grow? That's a really important question. Will this help me grow? I'm convinced that these other things, if they're in place, you're a believer in Christ, you've surrendered yourself, submission, your mission under his mission, you offer yourself to him, uh, you've come to the conclusion that there's nothing about this decision that's out of bounds. This is, this question, will this help me grow, is where God is going to direct you towards his best for you. There may be many options inside his will that fit in his will, but one of them, two of them, are better than the others. One is best. And the way he's going to figure out which one is the best for you is the one that's going to help you grow the most. Because you see, his best for you is simply living a surrendered, obedient life. That's his best for you. And you can do that regardless of who you're married to, regardless of what college you went to, regardless of what job you're in. You can live your best life with all that stuff being completely out of whack. But he longs to see his power at work in those things as well. He wants to lead and direct you to a place to go to school and to a person to marry and to a job that will be fulfilling and a place of mission for you. And he wants to do that, and the way he's going to do that is most likely in this question here. Let me show you how this works. Let's um, talk about some of the decisions that popped into your mind when I asked you at the beginning of my message if there are any decisions that you're struggling with. Uh, let's say some of you are trying to figure out where you're going to go to college. And uh, let, let's say you're a very bright young person, and you've been accepted to a, a number of different universities, uh, but two have kind of bubbled to the top, and I know I'm going to get a reaction when I say this first one. The first one is Texas A&M. Thank you. The second one is Harvard. Yeah, all right. Okay, and so you're, you're, you're really excited about both these schools, and you're trying to figure out which one you want to go to, and you want to know which one God wants you to go to. So you go through, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and Lord, I've really given this to you. I surrender this to you. Wherever you want me to go to school, I will listen. Are any of these schools out of bounds? And you come to the conclusion, no, there's nothing institutional about either of these places that is out of bounds for me. So the question is going to come down to, which place will I grow more in my walk with Jesus? Now here's an interesting thing. Some of you are thinking, well, obviously Texas A&M. <laughs> I know you're thinking that because you went there and you know what a great place it is and how conservative it is and how many neat Christian kids there are there. And you think, that's a perfect place for someone to grow and walk in their faith uh, while they're in college. But you see, some people would flourish in their walk much more in an ultra-liberal setting where their faith is coming under fire and they're having to do a deep dive to figure out why they believe what they believe and their professors are coming after them and, and they're growing and they're talking to their pastor while they're... Some people would flourish and grow much more in that setting. And this is what's so beautiful about this. Individually, we go before the Lord and we say, which place would I personally grow in better? And then you offer and you ask him, say, Lord, shall I go to Harvard? And he'll give you a silent yes or no. Shall I go to A&M? Over time, he'll give you a silent yes or no. He'll make it clear to you if you're fully available to him. Could you go to either? Yes. Both are on the playing field. Is one better than the other? Yes. Seek him. And it's mostly going to be about where you will really grow and develop in your walk with him. Some of you maybe have an opportunity to transfer jobs. One of the jobs is out of town and you'll have to relocate your family, so a lot of upheaval, and you're trying to figure out what God wants. And so you go through the process. I offer this to you, Lord, I really do. Is either of these jobs out of bounds? Well, actually, you've heard rumors that the job that you're looking at out of state, that sometimes they get a little uh, funny business with the books. You do a little research and you find that some of the employees there have been pressured to fudge on their numbers a little bit. And you discover that there's some unscrupulous ethics in that office. And so you find yourself realizing, you know what? Some of that stuff's out of bounds. I don't want to be a part of that. So God is directing you to a decision of no because there are things that are out of bounds. But let's say for sake of argument that both of them are in bounds, everything's cool, and, and you could go either way and still be in God's will. So the question is, which uh, of these will help me grow more? But it's not just you. It's which of these will help my spouse grow more and which of these will help my children grow in their walk with the Lord more. And you are diving into that and you're seeking the Lord. And over time, together as a couple, he gives you a silent yes or a silent no. 
Uh, you're ready to get married, you just haven't found the person yet. Who is it, Lord? I'm ready to get married. I don't know who it is. I heard that story about Jill Briscoe, and I got my list too, and I think, I'm, okay, I'm ready to give it to you. Now, where, where is he? Where is she? Well, I'm offering it to you. I meet a person. I'm starting to fall in love. I need to ask, is this person out of bounds? You say, well, could a person be out of bounds? Yes, biblically, some people are out of bounds for you. Like who? Well, if you are a man, all the other men are out of bounds. If you're a woman, all the other women are out of bounds. Scripture is clear. If you're going to marry someone, they will be of the opposite gender. Here's another one that's out of bounds. If they're already married to someone else, out of bounds. Not allowed. No. They don't belong to you. Here's another one. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and they are not, out of bounds. You say, why? I mean, I love them. They're such a neat person. I mean, they're nicer than most Christians I know. Okay. Here's why not. Because we're talking about God's best for you, right? We're not talking about settling. We're talking about God's best for you. And God's best for you in marriage is that you are joined in union with someone else who is in union with Christ so that you can draw together in your walk with him because, friends, that is beautiful. And if you marry someone who doesn't even know Jesus, you don't have that part of your marriage, it's far from God's best for you. And not only that, it's out of bounds. It tells us, do not be unequally yoked. It's not allowed. Because God wants his best for you. But let's say you're a believer, she's a believer, he's a believer, and you figured out you're all um, in bounds. And, and, you know, there's, you know, for each of you single people here, there's four or 5,000 people in the world that you could easily marry in God's will. The question is, who's the one that he wants me to say yes to? So we come down to this question again. Will this person help me grow? If I attach myself to this person for the next 40 years, will I be closer to Jesus after 40 years or farther from Jesus after 40 years? Is this person going to challenge me? And, and as you're praying with the Lord and as you're grappling with this, and you're seeking him, over time there's a silent yes or a silent no. Whichever way he leads you, in his power, you step into it by his grace. You want to buy a house? You want to buy a bigger house? Yeah. I'm a believer. I've offered this to the Lord. Lord, I'll buy it or not. Is this out of bounds? Oh, stop for a second. Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. That's a question you need to ask yourself before you buy a bigger house. Am I just conforming to the patterns of this world? If in the process you come to the conclusion, no, that's not what's... A, happening here and then you go to the next question will this help me grow and and the lord can lead or direct you and you know what he may be leading you to buy a bigger house in freedom buy the bigger house but only do it after you've had your silent yes and if he gives you a silent no don't buy the bigger house you're trying to decide whether to move in with your boyfriend or your girlfriend it's a big decision no, you're a believer, and you've offered this to the Lord. All right, Lord, I give it to you. Do you want me to move in with my boyfriend or girlfriend or not? Is this out of bounds? <laughs> yeah, it's out of bounds. Scripture is categorically clear. Sexual intimacy is designed and reserved for a biblical marriage only. It's the only place it's okay. It's out of bounds outside of that. So the biblical answer is No. And he will confirm it in your spirit with a silent no. You'll get no, 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 no. And some of you heard the no, and you blasted right through it. And you're living that way now, and you need to hear this message. Because it is not God's best for you. It's not. And it's not too late to make a correction so that you can be available for his best for you. What is his best? Well, you know, if you're a guy... His best in one day. Yeah, there she is. Got a little eyelashes. And wee, ah, and oh, and wee, wee. And one day, because you are preparing yourself for his best, if that's what he has for you, she or he comes into your life, you're ready. You're ready to give your best to her. 
You're ready to give your best to him. And now you can experience his best for you. Libby and I went back to Milwaukee and we sought counsel. We talked to a lot of people. We said, should we move to Dallas or not? And started to get a lot of encouragement to really seek the Lord on this. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we asked and we asked and we asked. And and the more we prayed, the more we talked, the more we sensed God saying, go, go. But then we would think about how far we'd be from family and how hard it would be to uproot our lives and we'd start to waffle and we pray and we'd sense this silent yes. And we got to the point where we were about 99.9% ready to say yes and we decided we were going to pray for one more day and uh, just ask the Lord, you know, if you want to say no, now's the time because we're about to say yes. We're kind of throwing that prayer out too. Show us. It's a big decision. And uh, Libby was driving to work and as she's driving to work, she's praying, Lord, tell us, just tell us. We just want to know. Tell us. She pulls up to a stoplight right near her office. As she's sitting there at the stoplight praying, a semi-trailer uh, with the whole big thing in the back drives by her. And in six-foot letters over the whole back part of the trailer, it said, Carrollton, Texas. Have you ever seen that truck in Carrollton, Texas? We've never seen it here. It was in Milwaukee that day for some reason. You see, sometimes God confirms a silent yes with a really loud yes. Sometimes, and it's only when we're in danger of missing the silent yes, I think. Here's the deal. Most stories you hear about people hearing God's voice, most of them tell you about the trailer. We didn't come here because of the trailer. We came here because of the six months of this that came before the trailer. The trailer was almost just like, are you kidding me? God is not a magician trying to impress people. God is a loving father trying to lead people. And so don't be waiting for the trailer. Most of the time the trailer doesn't come. Just quiet your heart before the Lord. Say, Jesus... I'm a believer. You live inside me. I offer myself to you in this decision. Tell me if it's out of bounds. If it's not, tell me, will I grow? Please give me the silent yes. Give me the silent no. I want to know your best for me. The good news is he already knows the best for you. The good news is you can discern it if you're available to him. Let him tell you what it is. Please bow your head. Close your eyes. I just want to walk you through a little prayer time. If there has been some decision that has been on your heart, you've been thinking about it all the way through the message, let's practice what we just preached. And let me walk you through a guided prayer time. Lord, um, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are on the playing field, those who are indwelt by your spirit, so they have that inner voice in them. I, I want to l- l- give them an opportunity right now to bring this specific decision to you, Lord. And you're so amazing. You can hear all these prayers at once. You're just so great. So, Lord, I, I want to ask um, each of these folks to honestly offer themselves to you in this decision, to submit their mission to yours, even in this moment, at this moment in time, say, all right, whatever you want to do with this, I'm good with it. I trust you. Lord, tell us if there's anything about this decision that's out of bounds. Remind us of scripture that we've read. If it is out of bounds, tell us. Remind us. If we're not sure, then give us the opportunity this week to study your word or talk to our mentors and figure out what you've said about this in the past so that we can be available to you for that. Lord, if I stepped into this decision, would I grow in my walk with you would, would be a transforming thing for me.
Would I grow in my intimacy with you? Would I grow in my trust and my faith and my surrender to you? Lord Jesus, even in this very moment, give me a silent yes in my spirit or a silent no if this is not your best for me. Lord, I believe that you care. I believe that you're interested, not just in the big major decisions of life, but the medium ones and even the small ones as well. And so we want to stay in a place of perpetual surrender to you so that we're always available for you to lead us and guide us. And Lord, teach us to hear your silent yes and your silent no well. And I pray it all in your powerful and precious name, Jesus.